So do you know the five classes of diuretics, how they work, what are their clinical indications and their side effects? If not, watch this video to find out. Welcome to this short video on the five classes of diuretics. In this video, you will learn the mechanism of action of these five diuretics, these five classes of diuretics. We're gonna learn the indication, the clinical indications of these medications and how they're slightly different. And then lastly, their main adverse effects. The first thing we need to know though, is what is a diuretic? Well, it's essentially an agent, a, me a medication that will increase diuresis, which essentially means urine output. So you would do this because you want to get rid of body fluids, okay? In particular conditions like hypertension, you wanna use it for cases of, to get, get the blood pressure down. You might wanna use it when there's certain build up of pressure like edema, you could have edema in the lungs, pulmonary edema in the brain, cerebral edema in the abdomen, like ascites, or maybe peripherally in the body. Also, you may use it for cases of heart failure or renal failure, or maybe hyperkalemia. So we're gonna go through the five classes and they're different indications. Now, the way that these, these medications work is all about the, the nephron. So if you're not familiar with a nephron, I suggest you watch Mike's video on the nephron, specifically the anatomy, so the different parts of the nephron, and then secondly, the water and the electrolyte handling at the nephron. But for today, what we're gonna focus on is specifically how water moves through it and essentially, excessive amount of water, which is di diuresis, which is the whole crux of why we take diuretics or we why we'd use diuretics. So we have this, these nephrons in our kidneys, there's about a million per kidney. And what it's essentially gonna do for us, at least for the context of today, is to filter blood. So when the blood comes into the nephron, comes through the renal artery and then gets smaller until it comes in the afferent vessel and it comes in this this bundle of blood vessels that we call the glomerulus. Here, all the plasma comes out of the blood. And when it moves across into the first part of nephron, we change the name from plasma to filtrate. And so what we wanna do with the filtrate as it moves through the nephron is the kidney essentially wants to pull out all the important things or reabsorb it and puts it back in the blood. So the blood vessel will continue along next to the nephron. So anything that it feels that it's important, it will pull it out, put it back in the blood. And anything that's either excessive or potentially harmful, it will come through in, into urine. So that's how we're gonna to work today. So what, what a diuretic will do is essentially change the components of the filtrate to therefore pull water with it, and that will therefore cause a greater volume of urine. Now there are five classes of diuretic, and there is actually five different points along the nephron where these five diuretics work. So that's fairly easy. So we have the first one that acts up the front end at the filtrate level. Number two works at the PCT, which we call the proximal convoluted tubule. Number three works at the loop of the Henle, particularly the ascending loop. Number four works at the distal convoluted tubule, and number five works at the collecting duct. So that's pretty straightforward. Before we get onto the specifics though, I just want you to get around the idea, the concept around the filtrate. So what we could do is two main things. We either put more solutes in the filtrate, therefore water sucks with it, or in the, the last four categories, we just put more sodium back in the filtrate or we, put, we, we reabsorb less sodium back into the blood. And if we have more sodium or salt in the filtrate, therefore water will go with it. So the, the, the last four have everything to do with sodium. The first one has more to do with the initial solute, which we'll talk about in a second. Now with sodium, the way that sodium is reabsorbed if all the sodium was to come out of your plasma here and you wanted to reabsorb it all, about 65% would happen at the PCT. 15 to 20% would happen here at the loop of Henle. About 10% would happen at the distal convoluted tubule and about one to 5% occur occurs here. And this is essentially how these drugs will work. So number one, the first diuretic that we need to know are what we call osmotic diuretics. And what they essentially do is they'll put 
uh, a solute into the blood. It's usually injected through an IV solution. It will go into the blood and when it comes through into the filtrate, it's going to be pulling water with it. Okay, now a good example of this is what we see in diabetes. So in diabetes, we know that the people with diabetes have a problem with glucose levels. So when glucose gets to a certain number, specifically above 12 millimoles per litre, what that will do is it's too much sugar, because that sugar will come into the filtrate, it's too much sugar to be reabsorbed. So that means sugar will go down the filtrate and it will bring water with it. That's why it's called osmotic, osmotic because it's, it generates osmosis. So more water goes with it, and this is why we get polyuria with diabetes. So the osmotic diuretics, the most common example is mannitol. And this is essentially just a sugar. And so what happens is we put the mannitol into the blood and it will go through the blood and then when it comes into the kidney, it will come through and the, mo the main parts of where water is normally passively reabsorbed, which is in the PCT and the descending loop, the mannitol will pull the water with it, therefore the volume increases, the urine volume increases, and then we urinate it out. So that's the first one. Number two, okay, these next four is all about sodium. So number two is, is actually acting on an enzyme, and we call this enzyme carbonic, I'll just abbreviate it, carbonic anhydrase. So carbonic anhydrase is an enzyme, and this is an inhibitor. So it inhibits this. And a good example of this particular drug is acetazolamide. So this is a common carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. Now, the way this will work, as I said, it's going to work in the PCT. So if we, if we zoom in, so just at one cell, zoom in over here, the way that it works with preventing sodium reabsorption is in the following ways. Sodium will come through in the filtrate along, along the tubule, down in the form of sodium bicarbonate. Now before we go any f further, what we need to do is put, to create an environment where we have low amounts of sodium in the cell. So at the back of the cell near the blood, so this is where the blood would be running down next to the nephron, is a pump called a sodium potassium pump. And what that will do is it will pump out sodium, three sodium in exchange for potassium, okay? But what that will essentially do is make the inside of the cell very low in sodium. So there's a great, there's a strong gradient to pull sodium in. So when sodium comes along in its form of sodium bicarbonate, they separate into sodium and bicarbonate. Sodium will come into the cell through a transporter with exchange of hydrogen. So hydrogen goes out, sodium comes in. Bicarbonate, which is this one, continues on, but it will then meet its hydrogen proton. So hydrogen then meets up from coming inside the cell. So you put that together with the help of carbonic anhydrase, which is the enzyme that we spoke about, will join those to get together to make carbonic acid. So H2CO3, okay? So that's carbonic acid. Here, this carbonic acid would dissociate again into water and carbon dioxide. Okay, from here, carbon dioxide will diffuse into the cell. It can also diffuse into the cell from the blood. Here it will meet water, okay, so CO2 and water, with the help of carbonic an anhydrase, again, same enzyme, which will give you back to carbonic acid, which we saw the same as here, okay. And then what that can do is dissociate again into hydrogen, which will allow the whole loop to occur, but it can put the bicarbonate back into the blood. And so what this process allows is a good uh, ability to maintain pH. By doing this process, not only do we reabsorb sodium, and, um, we but we can also play around with the pH, which is very important because we know the kidney has a strong role with pH. And it does this by reabsorbing bicarbonate. Now, with the car carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, it blocks this enzyme working. So therefore, what happens is this whole process stops, and therefore, essentially, we just have 
sodium and bicarbonate pass in through um, and then water will go through with it and that's how we have an increase in urine volume. So that is the second type of diuretic and that occurs at the PCT. Okay, number three, this one occurs at the ascending loop of Henley, number three. And we call this, because it's at the loop, we call it a loop diuretic. Okay, di. Okay, the, now the good examples of loop diuretic is furizamide or bumetanide. Okay, now we're going to zoom in here and bring it across to here. So again, these are just cells lining the nephron. Blood on the, on the base, this, this area here is the apical side where you'll get the filtrate, which is here. So as the urine is passing through, in this case, slightly different. Again, we do have the sodium potassium pump. So again, sodium's leaving, going into the blood. Potassium's coming back into the cell. So again, that generates a pulling pressure for sodium. So sodium will come along and it will, wants to be reabsorbed. So it will go across this channel, but it's going to pull other things along with it. It's going to pull potassium with it and two chlorides with it. So that actually makes the channel or the symporter a sodium potassium two chloride channel. Okay. All of those things go in together. What then happens is both the chloride and the sodium will go into the blood. Now the potassium starts to kind of build up in the cell, but because we lose a bit of charge from the sodium, the potassium can then diffuse, it can kind of go through a leaky channel and leak out of the cell back into the lumen side, which gives a, a more of a positive charge on the apical membrane. Now what that will do is it will cause an electrical, electrochemical draw, particularly for calcium and magnesium to be sucked between the cells into the blood. Now that's important because when we look at this, the way this medication works, we do have an effect on these, on these electrolytes as well. So this particular medication, the loop diuretic, actually blocks this channel. So what we see as a result is we lose sodium, we lose potassium, and we lose chloride in the filtrate, water goes with it, so does the volume. But because we lose potassium, we're all gonna also lose that draw in for calcium and magnesium. So we're also gonna lose those two um, cations as well. So all those things are gonna get pulled off and dropped through in the urine. Now this is the strongest diuretic. So this is a very, because we, we as we said here, about 25% of sodium is reabsorbed. So that's a lot of osmotic drag that it can take water with it. So this is a very strong diuretic. Moving on, we've now come to the DCT. Now this is about 10 to 15% of sodium reabsorption happens here. Okay, now the way that this occurs, well, firstly, I should tell you the, the um, diuretic that works at this level. This is what we call thiazide diuretics, thiazide. Okay, and a good example of these, a good example of this particular class of diuretics is a hydrochlorothiazide medication. Now the way that this drug works, firstly, let's just see the physiology. Again, we have the pump. So sodium will go out, reabsorbed in, potassium comes back from the blood back into the cell. Okay, what that will do is cause a gradient. So sodium wants to go across its channel here, but this is different to this one because this is just a sodium chloride channel. So chloride will go with it. So two go together then sodium and chloride will go back into the blood. Potassium starts to build up like we saw here. Potassium leaks through and that kind of a similar channel here. Now, the way that the thiazide works is pretty simple. It just blocks that channel. So essentially what we'll see happen is we'll lose sodium and chloride that will go out into the filtrate, into the urine. So will water, but because we're losing a a charge here, potassium tries to come out to kind of counter that electrical gradient change and we also lose potassium with it. So these are also very um, common drugs, particularly for hypertension, not as strong as this one, but they're also a very common 
diuretic particularly used in hypertension. Now we move to the last class and these are what we call, I'll just put K plus, which means potassium, potassium sparing diuretics. Okay, and the way that these drugs, what, what these drugs are going to essentially do is hold on to some of that potassium. We saw in these two cases we lose a lot of potassium, so this particular class of drugs is actually going to hold on to it. Now, we're working at the collecting duct level, so we're only looking at about 1 to 5% of sodium influence here, so it's not going to be such a strong diuretic, in particularly in comparison to the loop diuretics. So the way that these work, there's a group of cells down the collecting duct called principal cells or inter and intercalated cells. Now what these guys are going to do is again we're working at the pump level. So sodium's going out, potassium's coming in. So again we're getting a low concentration of sodium in the cell. This means that sodium will have the draw to still come into the cell to be absorbed but it doesn't have such a, a co-transport, it's just got its own channel. So it will just come through and then come across and go into the blood through that pump system. Now before I go on, an important principle is there's a, there's a chemical that sometimes the body releases to help hold on to water, particularly in cases of dehydration or low blood pressure, and this is called aldosterone. This is the location where aldosterone will work. So what aldosterone will do when it's released from the adrenal cortex it will come into the blood and it'll come through and it will actually because it is a steroid it will transfer through the membrane and act at the DNA level. Now what aldosterone will do is it will actually increase the amount of pumps and channels that are created and what that will do is bring more sodium in therefore more water in therefore we retain more water more blood volume greater blood pressure and that's a way of rehydrating. Now the way that the potassium sparing drugs work, at least one type will block aldosterone and this is a, a category that we call spirolactone. So spirolactone kind of mimics aldosterone but blocks its effect so we lose the pump and we lose the channel or at least the creation of that. Therefore we lose sodium sodium will go out but we also lose the pump so what we will essentially lose is the ability of potassium going out through that leaky channel to try and counter the loss of sodium. So we don't lose potassium. So that's part of the reason why it's a potassium sparing diuretic. Because we not only lose that, but if we lose the channel, and that's the other type of potassium sparing diuretics, which we call amylaride, and that doesn't work so much at the, at the pump, but it works at the channel level. But essentially in both cases, we lose that uh, ability of potassium leaking out. So we don't lose potassium, but we lose sodium. Therefore, we also lose water. So they're the five classes of, of diuretics. We saw the first one is up here, and that's the osmotic. The second one is at an enzyme level, which is the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. We, number three, we saw the loop diuretics. Number four, the thiazides. And number five, the potassium sparing. But let's summarize it now and we'll do it on a table. So take out some paper. So what I want to do here is quickly just put, fill this table out, just so you've got a very quick summary of how these diuretics work and how they're different to each other. So we'll start with the osmotic diuretic. So we've got the mechanism of action, we've got the use, and we've got the adverse effects. So osmotic diuretics, we saw that that works at the filtrate level. So these are inert, okay, which means they don't really do much else than just drag water with it. And the most common example is mannitol. Okay, so mannitol is a good example. Uh, and essentially what it's doing is just dragging water through osmosis, okay, in the, in the nephron. And the strongest locations where this works is essentially where water is passively reabsorbed in the nephron, which is either the PCT or the A sorry the descending loop. Okay, so that's how they work. In terms of their clinical use, they're not that common to be used on their own as a diuretic. In terms of for clinical indications like hypertension, 
for heart failure, etc. But what they're commonly used for is in cases of increased intracranial pressure. So this is where you have fluid starting to build up in the cranium and you want to pull that fluid out. So mannitol, if you inject it into the IV, what it will do is it will pull the water out because it's essentially hypertonic. So it's going to pull the water out of that space and into your, into your blood and that will reduce that pressure. Another thing it can do, which seems a bit strange, is in acute kidney injury. So this is where your kidneys are going into a stage of failure acutely. And in this case, it's specifically at a pre-renal cause. So if you had a patient that had um, a hemorrhage and lo lost a lot of blood, therefore there's not much blood going to the kidney. Now, what would happen if you've got a low GFR, so there's a low flow into the nephron, that means there's not much fluid moving through the nephron. And what fluid goes through the nephron would be reabsorbed completely in the PCT right at the start. That means the rest of the nephron, nephron dries out and that's going to cause further injury to it. So by giving mannitol, it will allow some water to stay in the nephron and flow through and then prevent further injury. So that's the kind of common two reasons to use those drugs. Now, a side effect or adverse effect is because it increases your extracellular fluid, okay, particularly your blood volume, that could put pressure on your left ventricle, particularly if you do have a vulnerable left ventricle already. So if you have a certain degree of heart failure, you're probably not going to be wanting to use this type of medication. So that's mannitol or osmotic diuretics. The next one is the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. So we spoke about that. An example of that is acetazolamide. Okay, now where this works is at the PCT, so proximal convoluted tubule. Okay, and the way that it works is essentially blocking the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. So what we're going to lose is both salt, sodium, and also bicarbonate, okay, with water. Now, because you're losing that, it's going to be, you're going to lose base. So you're actually going to put the person into a, a kind of acidic situation. So this um, could be useful because you may want to use this for cases where a patient is metabolic. Alkalo, alkalosis. And one example would be altitude sickness. So um, why this would be important? Well, if you go up altitude, your breathing would increase to try and counter the hypoxia. But as you breathe quicker, you blow off more CO2. That, that means you lose acid. That means you go into an alkalonic state. So by doing this, you could give them this drug, which would help counter metabolic al alkalosis. So it's essentially an acid forming um, diuretic. So that's also where it could be useful, altitude sickness, even preventatively. So you could give it prophylactically before they go in, up uh, in altitude. Another use it can be for is glaucoma. Because the same enzyme actually works within the eye to produce um, aqueous humor. So by blocking this particular enzyme in this um, channel, it's going to, to stop the creation of more fluid and then therefore pressure in the eye. Now the side effects would be the opposite. So it can put you into a metabolic acidosis. So that's the, the adverse effect of it. It can also increase the likelihood of kidney stones and that's tied up with the change in the pH balance. Another thing because it is, because this medication is a sulfonamide, just like some antibiotics, it does increase the, the likelihood of some rashes and um, inflammation to the kidney. So that's carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Now we move to the diuretics. This, so this works at the loop of Henle, okay, specifically the ascending loop. It, the channel that it works at is the sodium potassium 2 chloride channel. So what we're going to essentially lose is sodium potassium chloride, but remember we also lose magnesium and calcium. Now the uses, 
as I said, this is the strongest um, diuretic, so it's very useful in cases like hypertension and heart failure. It's also very good for pulm pulmonary edema. It could be used in cases of hyperkalemia. Congestive heart failure, even renal failure. Okay, and also, as I said, um, hypertension, particularly um, in cases where there could be some renal impairment. So the side effects, you can kind of reverse it, is well, you're going you're gonna to lose a lot of volume. So you can cause a hypovolemic state. So you've got to be mindful when you use this medication, particularly with the elderly, because you can lose fluid very quickly. Therefore, you're going to potentially produce hypotension. You're going to lose all these electrolytes. So you've got sodium, potassium, so hyponatremia, hypokalemia, low calcium, low magnesium. So these are all risks that you need to be aware of. Um, there's, interestingly, this channel is also located in the ear. So you can actually cause a condition that uh, causes a toxic effect to the ear. So ototoxicity. It can also change the pHase, but this does the opposite to this one. So it can cause metabolic alkalosis. And it's also going to change the way that uric acid is processed. So it decreases uric acid excretion. So it can cause changes to people who may be predisposed to gout. So that's the loop diuretics. Now we go to the thiazides. Now this one works at the distal convoluted tubule. It works by the sodium chloride channel. Okay, so we're going to lose the sodium, lose chloride, lose potassium, lose water. But interestingly, we actually retain calcium. So we don't lose the calcium like we saw with the loop diuretic. So that could actually be useful, particularly with uncomplicated hypertension in the elderly, because we're not going to lose calcium, which is very important because you want to hold on that because they've got a greater risk of osteoporosis. Also it would be used outside hypertension with mild congestive heart failure, probably less likely to be used compared to the loop but still very commonly used as a hypertensive, antihypertensive. Now, because um, you're, you're going to retain a lot of calcium and there's less calcium in the urine, it can also be used to prevent kidney stones because a lot of kidney stones have a, um, a basis of calcium. So if you have got no calcium going through the nephron to build up into a stone, that could be possibly used for that case. Now the side effects, like we saw here, you're going to have a decrease in, cal in potassium and sodium and magnesium. So electrolyte imbalances is something to be mindful of. Interestingly, there seems to be some evidence that it can lead to erectile dysfunction in men. And also similar, we saw that it's going to change the way that uric acid is secreted. So it's also an effect with making gout worse. Finally, we're left with the potassium sparin diuretics. So these two examples with spirolactone and amylaride. Spiro spirolactone works by blocking aldosterone. And amylaride's more about the just the sodium channel. But all together, these guys work at the collecting duct. Now, why they're used? Well, they're usually used in conjunction with one of the others, but when there is hypokalemia. So they're usually used as a diuretic in conjunction with the others, but particularly when there is low potassium. Okay. Also seem to be fairly um, indicated for liver issues, particularly cirrhosis.
Now you can probably guess because you're holding on to the potassium, an ill effect would be hyperkalemia. So an increase in potassium. Therefore it can cause metabolic acidose. as a side effect. And because it's changing the way that the aldosterone is processed in the body, which is a steroid, remember this is released from the adrenal cortex, so it can have a mimicking effect with um, the other steroids from that area, like um, the androgens. So it can cause, for men, gynomastia and also um, menstruation issues in females. And that's the way, that's, that's due to its kind of mimic an action with aldosterone. So it can have an effect on the other uh, androgens and the other sex hormones. So there we have it. There are your five classes of diuretics. We saw on the other side how they work. And now we can see outside the general uses of diuretics being for hypertension, for renal failure, for heart failure, and trying to get rid of edema. We can see some other uses for why they're used and their main side effects.